All right, everybody. Time to review Unit 6. We said that there's two big themes of Period 3. The first one is revolutions. The second one is responses to it, to revolutions. The biggest response, and that response to revolutions, consequence of industrialization. And when we talk about Period 3, I like to think of the three I's, industrialization, imperialism, and immigration, with imperialism and immigration being the big consequences of industrialization and of all the political revolution of all the revolutions we talked about in period three the industrial revolution is going to be the most important one so first consequence of industrialization is you're going to see imperialism the states that are industrialized are also going to be the ones that conquer the rest of the world in this time period well they have to give themselves some sort of justification for why they have the right to imperialize Africa and Asia and parts of the Middle East. And they're going to come up with cultural, religious, and racial ideology, ideologies to justify imperialism. Things like the civilizing mission, social Darwinism, nationalism, and the desire to religiously convert indigenous people. All of these are rationales for why it was okay for them to take over other people's land, especially people who were not white and were not Christian. Now, as these industrial states expand, remember our industrial powers are Britain, the United States, Germany, France, Russia, and Japan. You're going to see two different types of expansion. Number one is the type of expansion where they're a country already had a colony in a part of the world like Britain and India at the start of period three. And what they do is they strengthen it. At the beginning of this time period, Britain only had trade posts in India. By the end of this time period, they're going to have control of all of South Asia. And in some cases, what you're going to see is originally a colony was held by a non-government entity and the government's going to take it over. For example, also Britain in India. Those trade posts at the start of period three were controlled by the British East India Trade Company. And the British East India Trade Company, by the middle part of the 19th century, had conquered much of India, and it was their territory. But then there was the Sepoy Rebellion, and the government intervened to put the Sepoy Rebellion down. But after the rebellion, the British government takes the colony over instead of giving it back to the British East India Trade Company, which causes that entity to go bankrupt. So this is India's example of a colony that was once controlled by a non-government entity, the British East India Trade Company, that gets taken over by the government. The United States and Japan are going to acquire colonies in Asia and the Pacific. The United States is going to conquer the Philippines from Spain. Japan is going to go into Manchuria and Korea in this time period and acquire colonies for them to take over. Now, in period two, we had two big powers in the world, Spain and Portugal. These powers decline dramatically. Why do they decline? They decline because they never industrialized. Now, how, how, what are the tools that industrial powers are going to use? In Africa, Europeans are going to use diplomacy, and they're also going to use warfare to colonize Africa. Remember, Europeans have a huge technological advantage. They're going to utilize that technological advantage in Africa to conquer all of it by the end of this period. Europeans are also going to establish settler colonies. How do you know a part of the world was once a British settler colony? There are white Christians there who speak English, like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Canada. And in the case of the United States, Russia, and Japan, not only are they going to develop territories overseas, they're going to expand their land holdings. For example, the United States at the start of this time period, we were 13 colonies on the Atlantic. By the end of this, the United States went from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, taking Native American and Mexican territories on the way. Now, not all indigenous people take these, uh, ex these European expansion lying down. Resistance to imperialism contributes to growing nationalism and anti-colonial movements. An example of this is the Boxer Rebellion in China. This fostered this idea of Chinese nationalism, and it was also an attempt to drive out the colonists. Sometimes anti-imperial resistance took, form, took various forms, including direct resistance. An example of direct resistance, a rebellion against imperialism, is the Sepoy Rebellion in India 
where the Sepoys take up arms and try to drive the British out. It fails, but it was an attempt. And sometimes rebellions occur that occur are inspired by religion, like the Zosa cattle killing movement. We talked about the Zosa cattle killing movement. This little girl claimed she had visions from the spirits that if we kill all the cattle and destroy all our corn, the spirits will drive out the British and replace our lost food. This was a rebellion inspired by religion. It also tragically failed and led to a famine and strengthened British control in Southern Africa. Now, what is it that industrial powers want? They want resources. What you're going to see all over the world is single export economies are going to develop to provide raw resources for factories and food for growing urban populations. For example, cotton will be grown in India, Egypt, and the American South. The, these are single export economies that are going to produce cotton and sell the cotton to these industrial powers. Other examples of like providing food, wheat in the American Midwest, cattle in the Southwest in Texas. There, you have single export economies developed all over the world whose um, whole economic development is based around one export, two industrial powers, and they use the money they raise from these single export economies to purchase finished industrialized goods. Now, there's two types of imperialism. There's the imperialism where your country gets taken over and you become part of a global empire. And then there's economic imperialism where in name you're free, but in actuality, your economy is controlled by foreigners. Industrialized states will practice economic imperialism in Asia and in Latin America. An example is Britain and China with the Opium Wars and with the unequal treaties where the British forced the Chinese to give them certain economic rights that cannot be taken away. Trade's gonna be organized in a way that benefits merchants and companies based in the United States and in Europe. So when these companies develop these trade relationships with single export economies, it's always gonna be in a way that favors American and European run businesses. Now, in addition to imperialism, you're also going to see migrations. Remember the two eyes, imperialism and immigration. New modes of transportation created in the Industrial Revolution make internal and external migrations easier. External migrations means from one world region to another, like Europeans and Chinese workers who come to America. In all of these instances, many times migrants end up in large industrial cities. European workers come, they end up in places like New York, Boston, Detroit, St. Louis. Chinese workers who come end up in places like San Francisco. This is going to contribute to a new global phenomenon of urbanization. Many of these migrants are relocating permanently. Sometimes, however, the migrations were seasonal. For example, a seasonal migration, Japanese harvesters in the Pacific harvesting things like sugarcane and pineapples in places like Hawaii and the Philippines. These workers did not stay year round. They came during the harvest season. They came during the planting season, and then they would go back to Japan. Many times migrants chose to freely migrate, oftentimes in search of work, like European workers coming to America, like Chinese workers coming to the, to the West to build the transcontinental railroad. However, oftentimes in this time period, the global economy is still going to use coerced and semi-coerced labor migrations, including slavery. Now, let me say something about slavery because I want to be very careful about something. Slavery, the transatlantic slave trade ends by the end of this time period. That's the end of this time period. It's going very strongly into the middle of the 1850s. So while it's an arguable point that these countries were still using slavery by the end of period five, of three, it's an inarguable point that, I mean, the United States has had, had legalized slavery until 1863 or 1865, depending on which date you want to use exactly. Um, and that's well into period three. So at least for a portion of this period, African slavery was used widespread. And remember our rule, if it's used for, if it's true for a part of the time period, it's tr considered true for the whole time period. Also, Europeans are using slave labor in Africa the whole time period, especially Belgium in the Congo. China and Indian indentured servants are going to be used by the British in places where they had outlawed slavery. But they needed large-scale work done, like sugar-producing islands in the Caribbean, 
like South Africa, where they're mining for diamonds. And you're also going to see convict labor used in places like Australia. What are the effects of these migrant workers? Migrants tend to be male, leaving women in home societies to take on more roles. Migrants cre create ethnic enclaves like Chinatowns, which are dead which are littered all over, dotted all over the map of the western part of the Americas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Peru, and East America, uh, the eastern part of the United States, places like New York City. But you also see Chinatowns in the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and in Australia. What does this do? Receiving societies, it introduces new culture into these societies. Also, Sometimes the receiving society doesn't always embrace migrants and they're going to implement racist policies to try to keep their culture from spreading. And in some instances, keep the actual migrants from coming to those regions in too large of a number. Things like the white Australia policy uh, where they limit the amount of Asians is a great example of that. So that is your really quick periods uh, unit six review. Have a wonderful